All right. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, High Throughput CRISPR-Cas9 Genome Engineering in Primary T-Cells being presented today by Judd Holtquist, an assistant professor of medicine at Northwestern University. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by LabRoots and sponsored by Horizon Discovery. My name is Louise Baskin. I'm a senior product manager at Horizon, and I will be moderating today's event. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that this event is intended to be interactive. We encourage you to submit as many questions as you would like at any time during the presentation. To do so, you simply type your question into the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and click on the Send button. Uh, we will hold several questions for Judd to answer during the Q&A session at the end, um, but additionally, we do have scientists standing by to answer questions as they come in during the presentation. We'll answer as many questions as we can, but if there's some that we don't get to, we will send you a written response by email. Also, you'll be view viewing the presentation in the slide window. If you want to enlarge it, just click on the double arrow symbol at the top right-hand corner of the slide. And if you're having any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab that's found at the top right of the presentation window, or you can report any problems through that Ask a Question box. Continuing education credits are being offered for this webinar, so please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab, which is located at the top right of the presentation window, and just follow that process to obtain your credits. And you can also check out the other tabs that contain helpful resources that might answer questions that could arise following the webinar. So now I'd like to go ahead and introduce our presenter, Dr. Judd Holtquist. Dr. Holtquist recently joined Northwestern University in Chicago as an Associate Professor of Medicine. His lab specializes in the adaptation of proteomic and functional genomic technologies to primary models of disease to better understand the host pathogen relationship. Now, his work on CRISPR technologies with Dr. Nevin Krogan at UCSF led to the development of the first gene editing platform for primary T cells and the identification of several novel pathways that contribute to HIV replication. And he'll be sharing some of that data and some new findings with us today. He's currently funded by the Third Coast Center for AIDS Research and the American Foundation for AIDS Research to uncover the molecular mechanisms that underlie HIV latency and reactivation. We're really pleased to have him speaking today to share his techniques and findings using high-throughput CRISPR-Cas9 in primary T cells. So with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Judd for his presentation. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Louise. Uh, it really is a pleasure to be here. Um, and really to start out my presentation today, I really just wanted to share with everybody these EM images in the upper left of a HeLa cell, in the upper right of a Jerkat cell, and in the bottom, three different images of primary CD4 positive T cells taken 0, 24, and 48 hours after stimulation. And the reason I wanted to share these images is because all of us as researchers really rely on immortalized cell lines like HeLa's and Jerkat's in order to uh, make discoveries uh, and push our biology forward. But we can tell even through a microscope at low magnification that these cells are actually quite different from each other, even at the surface level. And when you dig underneath to the underlying molecular architecture, the differences between a HeLa cell and a Jerkat cell and a primary T cell uh, are actually quite stark. And while this might not influence uh, much of normal processes, uh, basic metabolism, it does have very profound impacts when you're trying to take these findings and then translate them into uh, curable uh, or functional cures. So my research is really focused on human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV. And that's really where I really got into the field of primary T cell editing. So human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV, is the causative agent of AIDS. And it really took off in a worldwide epidemic in the 1980s. And currently, there are 37 million people infected, and that number continues to arise. This virus starts as an RNA molecule, which is then reverse, reverse transcribed into a DNA molecule that inserts itself into the human genome. This means once you're infected, you're infected for life and subject to all of the associated social, psychological, physical, and financial 
burdens that come with that status. There are a number of small molecule inhibitors to help with the treatment of HIV, but there is no cure. As such, there's constant and ongoing research as to how we can develop new small molecules and new agents for the treatment of HIV infection and for possible curative therapies. Now, much of the work that has been done prior to now has really focused on using immortalized cell lines as model systems for HIV replication, such that we could attempt to understand on a global level the genes that are involved in replication. A number of genome-wide RNA interference or RNAi studies that were conducted at the beginning of the century identified in each one of them nearly 300 genes that were thought to play a role in HIV replication. However, when we go back and use meta-analysis to compare these three genome-wide studies, we find that of the 300 genes that each one of these studies identified, only three genes were shared between all three studies. Why and how there could be such a large disagreement between uh, three very large and reputable laboratories as to which genes control HIV replication were, in fact, uh, the subject of many more publications in the years to come. But all of these publications came to two primary conclusions. The first being that cell lines do not really authentically recapitulate the intracellular environment of a host cell. And the second is that RNA technologies are severely limited by their transient activity, their incomplete knockdown, uh, and significant off-target effects. And so this led us to want to try to identify genes that control HIV replication using knockout strategies, uh, primarily in primary T cells. So a few years back, uh, the labs of Jennifer Darna at UC Berkeley and Alex Marson at UCSF came up with a revolutionary CRISPR-Cas9 technology uh, to allow for the delivery of CRISPR-Cas9 ribonucleoproteins directly into primary cells. So CRISPR-Cas9 is a two-part system, a programmable nuclease that then binds to a guide RNA. That guide RNA then directs the programmable nuclease to specific sites of the genome to create a double-strand break. When the endogenous repair mechanism within the cell repairs that break, uh, it does so without necessary uh, fidelity repair, meaning that you can get knockouts, uh, and if you provide a homologous template, you can even direct knock-ins. Now, what Jennifer Doudna and Alex Marson's lab did that really allowed for this technology to be used in a primary cell is rather than delivering CRISPR-Cas9 on a lentivirus or with a DNA construct, they purified the Cas9 protein and the guide RNA in vitro, complexed them together, and then used electroporation to deliver them to the cells. The reason that this is so effective uh, is actually for five main reasons. The first is that this does not rely on any transcription or translation of nucleo nucleic acids. Uh, rather, you're delivering the protein and the RNA directly into the cells. The second major advantage is that you enhance the activity of the CRISPR-Cas9 you're delivering by pre-complexing this RNA and Cas9. Normally, in a bacteria where uh, CRISPR-Cas9 was originally discovered, uh, the bacteria are so small that the RNA and the protein find each other relatively easily. But in a mammalian cell, when you're trying to express them from DNA or RNA, the protein needs to be exported from the nucleus, folded, and then find the RNA before being re-imported to do the editing. By pre-complexing the RNA and the protein, you solve that space problem. The third main, ad main advantage of using these CRISPR RNPs is that the protein complexes are actually cleared from the cells shortly after editing. So no residual changes are left to your cells uh, beyond the actual edits that the proteins do to the DNA. This requires no selective markers and no selection. So you deliver, the CRISPR RNPs do their work, and then they're cleared from the cell uh, without selection. And finally, these, this technology allows for the editing of primary cell types. Uh, most immortalized cell lines have been selected for their ability um, to robustly be grown ex vivo, but most of these cells lack 
a lot of the endogenous repair mechanisms that are found in primary cell types. This prevents the use of DNA or lentiviral constructs in many different types of primary cells, and the use of CRISPR-Cas9 RNPs gets around this problem as well. So based on this breakthrough from the Doudna and Marsden labs, uh, in 2015, we teamed up with them to generate a high-throughput platform for primary T-cell editing using CRISPR-Cas9 RNPs. The way that our platform works is we isolate T-cells from donor blood, we use those primary human T-cells, uh, and activate them with CD3 and CD28. These activated T-cells can then be electroporated with CRISPR-Cas9 ribonucleoproteins generated ex vivo. These polyclonal knockout cells that result from this electroporation can be expanded uh, and continued to use then in downstream phenotypic assays. These pools can then be verified that the knockout worked at both the sequencing level and at the immunostaining immunoblotting level. Now what this really does is it allows for us to use primary T cells as a genetic platform truly for the first time. Uh, and what we did with this technology was first begin to investigate some of the genes known to be critical for HIV replication. So how HIV enters a T cell is the use of two receptors called CD4, which is the main receptor, and CCR5, which is the co-receptor. We decided to target CCR5 on the T cell surface to see if we couldn't generate primary T cells that were resistant to HIV infection. But before I go any deeper into the data, I wanted to share some details about the protocol itself, which reflects many months of technical tweaking to devise a system that can generate primary knockout T cells in a high throughput and efficient manner. So just for your information, all of the details for reproducing this platform are available as a protocol currently uploaded on BioArchive. Uh, the number is 205500, uh, as shown up above here. So each reaction can tolerate anywhere between 100,000 and 1 million primary T cells uh, in a volume of roughly 20 microliters. And we can achieve editing efficiencies over 99%. Uh, with the average efficiency being between 70 and 80 uh, percent, consistent among, between donors and loci. Each reaction takes less than two hours and can be done in 96 volt format, so you can do hundreds of manipulations in a single afternoon. All reagents are commercially available or can be readily synthesized in-house, so I really hope that this platform can be widely adaptable uh, to many different people's uh, uses. Furthermore, this method supports multiplexing and can be used to easily generate double and triple knockout cells. Uh, and importantly, we see little to no toxicity after 24 hours. So the cells continue to divide, uh, they continue to be stimulated as normal, and they can be infected as per usual with no observable adverse effects. So first I wanted to go through a few considerations for the handling of the T cells and the ribonucleoprotein complexes or RNPs themselves. So in our experience, the culture conditions are a critical variable when optimizing CRISPR-Cas9 delivery. For primary T cells, they are most susceptible to editing when fully stimulated, but we've also found that strong stimulatory signals can deter the long-term viability of the population. So to strike the right balance between editing efficiency and viability, we first stimulate our cells with plate-bound anti-CD3 and soluble anti-CD28 for 72 hours prior to nucleofection. And then this is followed by a second round of stimulation with bead-bound anti-CD2, 3, 28, and uh, beads immediately after the nucleofection. Uh, these conditions may differ depending on the experimental design, but the editing really appears to be highly efficient as long as you can achieve complete activation. So, for example, we've had great success editing PHA IL-2 stimulated cells, but this method is so strong that it often comes at a cost of cell viability. So it's really all about finding the right balance and what works for you in your experiment. So another consideration along these lines is that when you're generating the RNPs, I always recommend that you have an excess of guide RNA. I synthesize mine at a ratio of two parts guide RNA, trace RNA, to one part Cas9, and this really ensures that the Cas9 protein is fully complexed with the guide RNA. 
a variety of Cas9 proteins and a variety of RNAs with different modifications are available from different vendors, but they all appear to work consistently uh, with this methodology. Uh, finally, one last consideration is that given that each cell only has two alleles to edit, the RMPs are actually quite in excess in each reaction. Uh, and in fact, if an RNP is highly efficient, it can be multiplexed with other RNPs for the generation of double knockout or even triple knockout cells. Uh, and this can be useful in the study of functional redundancy or epistasis. When I do my own double or triple knockout generation, I find that it's most effective to generate each of the RNPs individually and then mix them at equal molar concentrations prior to delivery to the primary T cells. When it comes to the actual experimental controls and the design of the CRISPR RNA reagents, um, it's very similar to any experimental system where the right controls are really critical for downstream interpretation of your results. So generally, each plate of a screen or each small experiment should have at least three types of control. Uh, one, a positive control with a strong effect on the phenotype being assayed. Two, a negative control or a non-targeting control. And then three, a toxicity control. So for a positive control, I recommend at least two distinct positive controls that target genes with predictable effects on the phenotype that's being assayed. So in the screen I'll be talking about a little later, we use actually three different positive RNP controls that target genes with known impacts on HIV replication. These are really helpful for being sure that your assay is working as it's supposed to. Now the second type of control is the negative control. Uh, and for this, we recommend including at least two distinct non-targeting guides per experiment. Uh, and if you're doing this on a plate, these should be distributed randomly. So for example, you can correct for edge effects on your plate. The final control that I, I recommend in any experiment uh, is a toxicity control. So we recommend actually targeting a gene that's essential to cell health or cell division. So in the screen I'll talk about in a little bit, we actually use the gene CDK9, which is essential for cellular health of primary T cells. So in most donors, successful knockout of this control will, will result in significant toxicity and cell death. In comparison of this well's cell count, viability, uh, and the phenotype of those experimental wells is really useful for setting your thresholds for analysis uh, and identifying other potentially essential genes uh, in your experiment. For experimental targets themselves, we recommend ordering three to five distinct guide RNAs per gene. For most loci, this will yield at least one guide that exhibits high efficiency editing. Uh, and as you'll see, this redundant information can provide additional confidence in the phenotypes that you're seeing, but it also provides really uh, important additional information when you're considering genetic variations between your different donor samples. Finally, I wanted to go over a few considerations for screen design uh, before we jump into the data. So I always really strongly recommend that when you're going to be doing a high throughput application that you validate your system using a positive control in a pilot experiment. So this pilot really provides critical information in helping you to optimize your controls, optimize your time points, determining your sensitivity windows, et cetera. Uh, for the ease of setup, all of the guide RNAs can be ordered from commercial sources pre-arrayed in 96 flow plates, and really conveniently this orientation can be preserved for RMP generation uh, as well as electroporation, uh, nucleofection, new HIV spreading infections, uh, or additional phenotypic assays. When considering which assays to run, however, it's really critical to minimize the downstream handling because at large scales, even doubling an experiment can very quickly create unanticipated time and cost burden. Uh, and I'd also recommend that you consult with domain experts prior to experiment initiation to ensure that the design is both technically and statistically robust. So when used carefully, this approach can be incredibly powerful, uh, as I hope some of this data will demonstrate. So here I'm showing a pool of T cells isolated from a donor that was then either left unmodified, treated with Cas9 protein alone, or treated with CRISPR-Cas9 RNPs targeting the CCR5 locus. And as you can see in the upper panel of flow, 
we are staining for CD4 on the x-axis and CCR5 on the y. And while the unmodified and Cas9-only treated cells have levels, high levels of CCR5 on the cell surface, when we target CCR5, we can see that expression is completely dissipated. When we stain for CD25 or CD4, we see no change in those cell surface markers, meaning that this editing is specific to the CCR5 locus. So we can take these cell pools and then infect them with a CCR5 tropic HIV. In the green bars, I'm showing results from two different donors, top and bottom. In the green, I'm showing the percent of CCR5 knockout at the protein level. The blue bars indicate the replication of a CCR5 tropic virus. And as you can see, in the Cas9-only treated cells, we get nearly 100% infection. And with the CCR5 knockout cells, we see an over order of magnitude protection from infection. And if we take these viruses and pseudotype them with a different viral envelope that's not dependent on CCR5, we can fully restore the infection. This indicates that one, these cells are not overtly sick or overtly toxic. They can support viral replication. But two, we can edit them successfully to prevent HIV infection. So this really opens the door for us to use the system to better understand uh, not only HIV, but autoimmunity uh, and other T cell mediated processes. So what we wanted to do next was really begin to move away from one gene targeted studies to see if we could actually do this hundreds of genes at a time. Remember I had mentioned at the beginning that there were several genome-wide RNAi studies that attempted to systematically identify host genes that were involved in HIV replication. While those studies didn't work out, we're hoping that this platform will now allow us to test hundreds of genes at once directly in primary T cells with knockouts, thus enabling us to come up with a more complete list of host factors that are truly required in vivo. So the, the genes that we decided to target sort of as a pilot for this uh, are 435 genes that were previously identified as HIV human protein-protein interaction. So a series of affinity purification mass spec experiments had identified 435 human proteins that were known to bind to HIV proteins. The reason that these 435 are truly interesting uh, is because they should be enriched for functionally important factors. The second main reason why studying these uh, would be a good first pass is that because there's a protein-protein interaction, it gives us a mechanistic handle for functional follow-up. And finally, we wanted to test these 435 to see how truly scalable and effective this technology could be across many loci and across many donors. So the strategy we use is laid out here. We arrayed CRISPR RNA, designing three CRISPR RNA per gene across all 430 of our targeted genes in 96 well plates and complex them with Cas9 protein in vitro. These Cas9 RNPs were then electroporated into activated T cells that we had isolated from two to five independent donors to create polyclonal knockout pools in 96 well plates. These we were able to expand and replicate and then infect with HIV with a GFP reporter. This infection was then monitored at three, five, and seven days post-infection by high throughput flow cytometry. In parallel, we extracted genomic DNA from these primary T cells and did deep sequencing over our CRISPR-Cas9 target sites to quantify the percent editing that we were able to achieve in each one of these populations. Therefore, we could cross-validate our HIV infectivity data with our mutational efficiency data to generate a map uh, of HIV host factors. So first, I wanted to run through some of what we learned with the deep sequencing data before going through our infectivity data. So for the deep sequencing, we decided to use uh, targeted strategy to look specifically at the sites that we were targeting for CRISPR-Cas9 editing. Using bioinformatic algorithms, we designed primers flanking the target site in each one of our specific guide RNAs. We used robotic fluid handling then to insert index primers and generate uh, our amplicons for deep sequencing. Now remember, CRISPR-Cas9 does not have a directed repair mechanism, but rather relies on endogenous repair machinery. 
That means within each well, you're going to get a diverse series of repairs. And we can use these different repair outcomes to quantify exactly the percent editing that we got uh, in our original nucleofection reaction. Of all of our 1,296 CRISPR-Cas9 cut sites, we were able to get good sequencing from 1,079, or roughly 83%, and we were able to get 71% uh, of this information in more than one donor. What we found was that overall, our editing efficiency in primary T cells using this technology was quite robust across all loci in the genome. So remember, we had used three guides per gene, and here I'm highlighting the most effective guide in pink, the second most effective guide in green, and the third most effective guide in blue for each one of the loci. What we can see is that for the most effective guide across every loci, we had an average allelic editing efficiency of roughly 75%. And this covers, again, sequencing data over 1,079 guides across 430 different editing sites. So overall, we were quite pleased with how effective this technology was, regardless of where in the genome you're targeting. The second thing that we were quite pleased to see was that the editing efficiency itself was quite robust. So we were able to achieve knockout over 50% of the alleles at 340 of the 430 targeted loci. When we compared this donor to donor, we found very, very high correlation using this technology in one donor versus another. So here we're showing all of the editing results from one donor versus another. Uh, and as you can see, we're getting an R squared of nearly 75. Uh, 0.75, which is quite extraordinary considering that these cells are from completely different people uh, and then have been edited in completely different reactions. Uh, and yet we see the strong concordance in editing efficiencies, meaning that one, the efficiency of a guide that you use once is likely to predict the efficiency when you use it a second time. Now, these guide RNAs were not always perfectly correlated one donor to the next. Uh, and what we found is that when a guide wasn't correlated donor to donor, it was often due to single nucleotide variations between different donors. So here I'm just, to illustrate this, I'm showing you an example of some of the sequencing results that we got. On the very top, we have listed our reference sequence and have boxed in our guide RNA. Now, I have the results from two donors then listed on the right-hand side. Now, donor number one actually had very few sequences that matched the reference sequence, and in fact was homozygous for a SNP at the location indicated by the red arrow. Uh, and that's annotated as SNV minus eight. Now, this SNP was homozygous in donor one, and we saw very few editing events as listed below that. However, in donor two, we saw that this was a heterozygote for the SNP, and for the reference sequence. And when we look at the reference sequence, we see a depleted number of wild type reference and a large number of editing, indicating that that one mismatch protected donor one from editing at this site, whereas the wild type sequence in donor two allowed for robust editing in an allele specific manner. So the donor to donor uh, lack of correlation in some of these cases is due to SNPs uh, at specific guide RNA sequences. But overall, we found very high correlations uh, at most of the sites on average between 0.6 and 0.8. Now, one of the coolest things that we were able to do with this data is now that we had sequencing data for over a thousand different sites uh, across many different donors, is we were able to use machine learning algorithms to actually predict what kind of repair outcomes you get from editing. So we took all of our sequence information uh, and combine this with information about the flanking sequence, the distance to the cut site, chromatin information, gene expression, and microhomology, and used gradient boosting machine learning algorithms to uh, create a prediction software that will predict the kind of CRISPR-Cas9 repair you will get from a cut. And we call this algorithm CRISPR repair outcome, or SPROUT. What we found is that all of the CRISPR guide RNA, uh, the repair could be predicted based on primarily two things, the sequence of the guide itself 
and the chromatin organization at the site of cutting. So here I'm showing the sequence features that actually were found to promote an insertion or a deletion. So one of the most striking features that we found from our machine learning algorithms were that the target site itself could predict whether or not you would get an insertion or a deletion upon doing the repair. So for example, if you have a G immediately next to the cut site, you are very strongly likely to get a deletion as opposed to an insertion. On the contrary, if you had an A immediately adjacent to your PAM sequence, you were very likely to get an insertion rather than a deletion. All of these tools can be used to design better CRISPR-Cas9 tools in the future. The second incredible thing that we found, besides that the sequence can predict the repair outcome, was that the chromatin architecture of the cell also dictates this repair outcome. So at almost every site, we found very large insertions. We're talking somewhere in the range of 10 to 20, all the way up to 80 to 90 base pair insertions. Uh, and we found these at almost every cut site that we were looking at. When we aligned these long insertions back to the human genome, we found that it matched specific chromosomal locations. And so if you look at the upper right panel, here we're doing a heat map of an insertion relative to where it originally came from in the genome. And when you look at the high C chromosome contact map, which is mapped immediately below that, you can see a striking resemblance between insertion probability and the chromatin architecture itself, indicating that when you're creating these double strand breaks, what happens in a rare number of occasions is you're actually stealing part of an adjacent chromosome and inserting it at that CRISPR site, uh, which was absolutely astounding to us when we first saw this data. Uh, it was absolutely beautiful. We had never predicted to learn so much um, just from doing these sequencing reactions at these sites. But this is, again, only half of our data set. This is really only focusing on the sequencing. But we also have paired infectivity data for every one of these wells that we looked at. So remember that we infected each pool of cells with the GFP reporter HIV virus and monitored the infectivity at three, five, and seven days post-infection. What we found is when uh, we did this in technical triplicate, uh, here we're plotting the log two-fold change in infection from the median. In all three of our replicates, we found very high reproducibility in our infections. And we found very high reproducibility in our controls. So in every single place that we ran, as a quality control, we ran the same six reactions on every single electroporation reaction to see how reproducible not only our electroporation was, how reproducible our editing was, but how reproducible our infection was. And so the first three columns here at day three represent our non-targeting controls. So these are our negative controls, and we get very strong correlation of the infection right at the median of the plate. When we knock out CXCR4, though, which is a necessary HIV co-receptor, we get uh, over negative four log two fold changes in HIV infection, all again directly in these primary T cells. When we knock out LEGF, which is a chromatin receptor, we see a one to two log fold change. And when we knock out CDK9, which is necessary for viral transcription, we see a similar change. And this change and these fold changes were highly reproducible, again, across all of our donors, across all of our reactions, indicating we have a robust pipeline. So here's looking at the data from all 1,511 guides that we transfected in across all of our donors, plotting the infectivity uh, on the y-axis. And what we can see is that a number of different genes that we targeted for knockout resulted in very strong defects in viral replication, while others that we knocked out actually increased viral replication somewhat. So we took this data and we plotted it relative to our editing efficiency in order to generate, for the first time, our paired data set of HIV infectivity relative to CRISPR editing. So on the x-axis, we're showing the uh, guides as arranged by their impact on affection. So this is the editing efficiency on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we're showing the log fold change of infection. 
And what we can see is that when you have very little editing, you don't see very much change in HIV infection. But as you get more and more editing percentage, you see these changes to the genome that result in really stark differences to how HIV can replicate. So how do we determine which one of these uh, are meaningful events and which ones are not? Well, we had to draw a cutoff somewhere. So what we did is we did titration experiments, putting CXCR4 knockouts, so these are cells that cannot be infected with HIV, and titrating them with our non-targeting controls. And using statistical analysis, we were able to determine that we need at least 30% editing in our population in order to identify uh, HIV host factors. Applying this cutoff then, we can determine a false discovery rate of roughly 1%. And therefore, we can identify 86 different genes in our data set that we can both edit and that showed a striking impact on HIV infection. 269 of the genes that we targeted, we were able to edit sufficiently, but we saw no change in infection. And 80 genes, we were either unable to edit uh, or ended up killing the cells. Uh, and so we were not able to get a reliable infection readout. Now, what you can do with this data is remember we had a physical map of how the HIV human interactome looks. We can take our functional data and apply that back onto our physical map in order to derive a functional map of HIV host factor complexes, combining both proteomic and genetic data in order to lay out the interactions uh, as they play out both physically and functionally. This uh, is a little bit hard to read at this scale. So here is the same data now presented in heat map format, where we're showing all the genes here indicated in blue. When we knock it out, decrease HIV infection. That means they're HIV dependency factors or that they're required for HIV infection. Anything in red actually is an HIV restriction factor. So it acts as an antiviral factor, and when you knock it out, increases HIV infection. Now this is incredibly crucial data set because any one of these genes, if we can target with a small molecule, could be used as a future therapeutic. None of this was correlated with uh, cell count, so we filtered out any genes that could be toxic. Uh, and in fact, when we looked at the cell count of only those factors uh, that decreased HIV replication, we found that the cells grew better because they were being protected from HIV infection. And when we knocked out a restriction factor, these antiviral factors, the cells grew worse because the virus was acting in a cytotoxic manner. Now, nicely, we are able to recapitulate a lot of known biology in this data set. Uh, so for example, here I'm just showing the physical interactions that are known to take place with the HIV TAP protein. So TAP is required for HIV transcription, and it hijacks the PTFB complex in order to replicate. Now, what I'm showing here uh, on the far left is a schematic of how it's known to work in human cells, uh, is that the PTFB complex composed of CDK9 and CCNT1, highlighted in blue, uh, is hijacked by this TAP protein and taken to the HIV transcription complex. Now, CDK9 and CCNT1 also bind to the three proteins shown in red, HEXM1, MEPSI, and LARP7, uh, and these actually act to soak it up and prevent HIV from uh, hijacking this complex. So nicely, what we found in our data set is when you knock out any of the proteins shown here in blue, so CDK9 and CCNT1, we see a decrease in viral replication. And when we knock out the three competing factors, hexa one MEPSI, or LARP7, we see an increase in infection completely consistent with what's been known in the field. To add an additional layer to this data set, remember that we took multiple time points at days three, five, and seven. And what we found is that if you actually look at the day three data alone, it can be used as a proxy for genes that act early or late in viral replication. Just in, as an example of this, uh, here I'm showing some data from the HIV VIF protein, which acts late in the infection cycle to counteract antiviral inhibition by the Apobex3 family of antiviral proteins. And what we found was that if you look at day three of our heat map, uh, we see very little in infectivity uh, changes from knocking out any of the factors associated with VIF. 
However, at days five and seven, we were able to see strong infectivity changes, indicating that this data set not only can striate phenotypes based on their functional or physical characteristics, but it can also do so temporally. So of the 86 host factors that we identified in this study, almost half of them have not been reported yet. Um, so while roughly 40 of them have been seen before in the literature, uh, over 40 of them have yet to been reported, uh, which just speaks again to the critical importance of using primary cells uh, to really understand what's happening at the molecular level. Just case in point, you know, one of these factors that we've been looking at, um, these new factors that hadn't been reported before, is non-histone chromosome protein 2 like 1, or H NHP2L1, uh, whose knockout inhibits HIV replication. Here you can see in the blue bar the replication over time of virus in a population of cells with NHP one knocked out, but that's the worst guide. In green is the second best CRISPR guide, in red is the best CRISPR guide. And you can see how the infectivity actually correlates with our CRISPR editing very nicely. Now we also know that this protein physically interacts with the gag protein of HIV, which is required for budding. And in fact, when we take a look at the viral particles that come out of these knockout cells, we see that they're almost all immature. And oftentimes they'll bud together in these long strings indicating that there is strong HIV budding and maturation defects. So small molecules that would inhibit the NHP2L1 gag interaction could be effective small molecule inhibitors down the line. So what did we learn from this study? Um, we found that primary T cells do indeed have a very unique molecular architecture, and it's not always re recapitulated by cell line models. So, of the 86 host factors that we found doing this work, uh, again, over 40 of them had not been reported in any model cell line. Uh, and so these are new host factors that we really need to understand their biology better in order to fully grasp how HIV replicates in vivo. The second thing that we learned is that CRISPR-Cas9 editing using ribonucleoproteins is highly efficient in primary T cells. Again, we're doing all of this without any selection, uh, without any integration of DNA, it's just a single pulse of these cells with protein and RNA. And we're able to achieve, uh, using just three different guide RNAs, well over 70% editing. The third thing that we learned is that the repair outcomes of CRISPR-Cas9 editing can be predicted based on both the sequence of the guide alone and based on the chromatin architecture, uh, which is something completely brand new that we weren't expecting to see from this data. And the fourth thing that we learned is that protein-protein interactions uh, really represent an enriched faction of host factors. And so co by combining large data sets such as proteomics and genetics like here, uh, we can learn a lot about a new system very rapidly. And so I just want to kind of close with the point. You know, we all know how scientific work is supposed to run. You, we have literature and data, um, and we're supposed to take this and generate hypotheses, ex validate it experiment experimentally, uh, generate more hypotheses, and this cycle is supposed to improve patient health and better treatment strategies. But in the age of big data and patient cohorts and primary samples, we're getting so much data that our ability to, hypo to generate hypotheses is, is much, much larger than our ability to, to test them. Limitations in our models, limitations in our tools, and most importantly, in a lot of cases, limitations in our own time prevent the number of hypotheses we can reasonably test. And so improvements in our ability to test hypotheses directly in primary cell models in a high throughput uh, is really critical for speeding the cycle uh, and improving patient health. And so with that, um, I did want to just quickly acknowledge a couple people before we, we get to questions. Uh, I wanted to uh, acknowledge Nevin Krogan, uh, who I did my postdoctoral work with uh, and who was instrumental in getting this work done, uh, as well as our fantastic collaborations with Alex Marson at UCSF, Jennifer Doudna at UC Berkeley, Andy May at the uh, Chan Zuckerberg Biohub, Wes Sunquist at the University of Utah, and John Gross at UCSF. Um, and I would also like to point out uh, that the protocol for how I do my primary T cell editing work is available on BioArchive number 205500.
Um, and with that, I'm happy to take take any questions. That was great. Thank you so much, Judd. Um, and I think that uh, that protocol that you've listed there is going to actually preempt a lot of the questions that have come in. Um, I might still toss a couple of those over to you live. Um, but I'll give you a minute to um, relax, and I'll let our um, attendees put in any last-minute questions. Um, I did just want to take a quick moment, um, since we have an audience who um, is, is likely thinking a lot about doing some sorts of gene modulation in primary T cells, I want to make sure you're aware that there is um, an RNAi technology that is very successful for gene knockdown um, as opposed to the knockout. Uh, in primary T cells and many other cell types that are equally very difficult to transfect. Um, this might be something that could, could really complement um, or um, be a predecessor to the CRISPR knockout work that, that you just presented. So a few years ago, we had another guest speaker like yourself, um, Dr. Michael Freely, who's with Trinity University in Dublin, and he spoke on his publication of an RNAi screen for regulators of T cell mobility. And in that study, he used a self-delivering sRNA uh, called Excel sRNA. So I'm not going to get into any of his details, um, but did just want to make sure that uh, there's awareness that Excel sRNA is uh, available. It uses patented chemical modifications that enable uptake by nearly any cell type. I've listed a number of uh, immunological cell types here that might be of interest. Um, it does not rely on any kind of transfection reagent a viral vector or electroporation. Um, it's, a, it's a passive uh, cell uptake technology. And so you'll, you'll be able to find on our website a list of publications that cite successful delivery and target gene silencing in a wide range of, of immunological and other uh, primary or, or difficult to transfect cell types. Um, if you'd like to um, see the recording of that webinar that discusses that uh, use of sRNA, you can find it on our website. Um, just click on the resources um, menu item, and then there'll be a drop down that lets you click on webinars. Um, and you'll be able to find it in that list of webinars, along with a number of different uh, CRISPR Cas9 educational pieces we've done in the past. Those are all available. Um, some tips and some findings on HDR for precise gene editing and knock in, um, arrayed CRISPR screening, uh, and, and CRISPR uh, applications with transcriptional activation. And finally, just to circle back around to today's topic, the protocol that Judd reviewed today can be carried out with the Editor Synthetic CRISPR RNA product line. You can get either pre-designed or your own designs delivered in tubes or in a multi-well plate uh, for that ease of use and support for the higher throughput methods that you just heard about. You can get up to five pre-designed CRISPR RNAs uh, for each target gene to ensure that redundancy that, that Judd pointed out as being really important to interpretation and accounting for potential um, genetic variation in your samples. Uh, the second component is the tracer RNA that is combined with the CRISPR RNA to form the full guide. Um, it is available in small or and we have some new bulk sizes that really help scale up with your needs. Um, it's very easy to use. There's no heating, cooling required for doing the hybridization. They're just combined um, at equimolar amounts. The Cas9 protein, of course, is needed for RNP delivery. Uh, we do offer a very concentrated version that's really useful for the protocol recommendations for either electroporation or uh, nucleofection. And finally, Judd mentioned the use of a control that can induce cell death. Um, and he talked about some specific genes that are known to be essential in T cells. But rather than having to dive into the biology of your cell, if you might be unfamiliar with essential genes in your system um, and, and needing to do that to find an, an appropriate essential gene to knock out, we've developed two lethal positive controls that are universal in their ability to induce cell death. Um, they do this by targeting repeat regions within the genome. And so with lots and lots of breaks in the chromosomes, we see programmed cell death um, in a dose-dependent manner that is Cas9 dependent but is independent of essential gene expression. So with that, I will go ahead and get back to the questions. Um, at this time, for our audience, two polling questions will appear on your screen. Uh, we do appreciate you taking just a minute to click on the best response for you um, to answer these questions. And remind you that you can still submit questions for, for Jed um, into that Q&A section. 
Okay, so Judd, our first question um, goes back to the the repair prediction algorithm you mentioned, the a Sprout, I think you called it, which, mm -hmm. is, which is pretty yeah. cool. Is that going to be something that is made available, um, or is it something that the the input is just simply not something that can just really easily be, you know, done over the web? Yeah. Well, what we're hoping to do is design a easy to use web application that can help people decide. You know, I've designed this guide RNA for my application. I want to see what the predicted repair outcome is. Uh, and what we're hoping to do is generate it from our research a really easy to use web tool that people can do that. Uh, and that's still under process. Um, the, the algorithm itself is, is still under review, so we want to make sure that we have it perfectly optimized before we put it out there. Um, sure. But yeah, hopefully that tool will be available shortly. Okay. And then uh, on the same topic, there's a question. So you, you're able to map the repair outcomes, which is really fascinating. Um, but did you see correlation in the efficiency of knockout? You know, for instance, were those, were those deletions tending to be more efficient or insertions, or was there really not a correlation that you could see? Well, overall, we found way more deletions than insertions. Mm -hmm. But we found that even our machine learning was unable to predict the overall efficiency of the guide. We were hoping that we could use this algorithm to determine, you know, here's a sequence, is it more or less efficient? Uh, mm -hmm. And we weren't able to do that at least to our uh, statistical satisfaction. Uh, the best that we were able to do is identify these patterns that correlate with insertions or deletions uh, or, again, these really long insertions. Okay. So even though you're able to sort of map or potentially now predict repair outcomes, it's not necessarily going to correlate to the, the kind of high Overall low efficiency. efficiencies that you were seeing. Exactly. Okay. Um, but again, okay. I was very heartened by the fact that using the current you know, algorithms that are available to design these guide RNAs, you know, we only designed three per gene, and on average, at least one of the three hit at least 75%. Um, and so I was very encouraged by that uh, piece of data. Right, right. Okay. Um, another question kind of along those lines um, that you, you just touched on, maybe this is also in the, in the protocol. Um, what was the source of your CRISPR designs? You know, how were they chosen? Were you using pre-designed or were you designing them your, yourselves? Yeah, so we actually used it from two different sources. Um, we designed some of them ourselves using uh, Rule Set 2, um, which is available in a web interface uh, using the MIT CRISPR web tool. Uh, but we also used a number of guides from DharmaCon's pre-designed library. Um, and overall, we found that either way, uh, the pre-design library or designing them yourself, we see very similar patterns in the overall efficiencies that we get. Okay. Um, and then looks like we have time. Okay, okay, I'll get a couple more in here. Um, did you do any um, expression analysis? So were some of the gene targets um, where maybe you didn't see an effect, um, were those simply just not being expressed in those T cells, or, did you, or was your gene set such that they really should have been expressed? Um, yeah, so, so the, gene set, the gene set all originated from proteomic data. So the proteomic data suggests that all of those gene products should have been expressed. Now, that being said, we didn't go and check to validate in all of our donors that our targets were indeed expressed at that time. Um, and so we don't know, but we have a high degree of confidence that they were indeed there. Okay. And then you'd mentioned that there was a difference between donors um, potentially due to a SNP, um, and, and you showed some good mapping there. Did you essentially resolve that just by having uh, m the multiple different CRISPR designs that you were able to, um, you know, maybe maybe discard the one that was showing a big difference and, and look at the others, or how did you resolve that? Yeah, isn't isn't that cool? It you know, <laughs> working with all these different donor cells, it just you know, it really blew my mind how different, you know, each donor to donor was. Um, and these, these SNPs created large disagreements in editing efficiency. Um, but luckily, you know, that's why we designed three guides per gene, not only because it's hard to predict which one is going to be most efficient, but also to just in case we accidentally hit 
one of these SNPs. Uh, and then it, I showed you one example of that. But there were actually quite a few of them. Um, yeah. But and, overall, and it's something that gets it's something that gets discussed. But to actually see the evidence of it, you know, makes it makes it very real. I know. I it was just crazy. We we couldn't believe it. Uh, it was a lot of work getting all the sequencing data, but we were so happy that we did because we we just learned so much from it. Um, and yeah, I'd highly recommend that if people are using this technology either in primary cells or in the cell line, you know, if you can get sequencing data from that specific line or cell type that you're using, that is way more useful for designing your guides than aligning it just to the reference sequence or design multiple guides like we did here. Uh, it's very important. Right, makes sense. Um, so with that, let me just wrap up with one just sort of um, what, what you might want your parting thoughts to be. So obviously you, you have all of the kind of the nuts and bolts of the workflow written up in that protocol that um, we'll make sure is, is made available to, to all the attendees. Um, but what would you say is kind of the biggest consideration or pitfall to avoid in, in really taking on you know, this, this CRISPR-Cas9 editing in primary cells? I think the most important thing to keep in mind if you're going to be doing gene editing in primary cells is that you monitor the efficiency of your knockout every time that you do it. So we found that donor to donor, you don't always get good correlation. Gene to gene, you don't always get correlation. And so being sure that you validate the reagents that you're using and the knockout after you've generated it every time you do it is really essential to be sure that you're tracking your phenotype correctly. Uh, that was one of our, our big takeaways from this work. All right, excellent. Well, I will let you end on that then. Um, thank you to the audience for all those great questions. And Judd, thank you very much for the presentation and, and all of your insights uh, in answering those questions. Um, Absolutely. Last, thank you so much for having me. You bet. Um, I also want to, uh, in addition to thanking you again, thanking LabRoots um, and Horizon Discovery for underwriting today's webcast. Uh, this webcast can be viewed on demand through March uh, of next year. And LabRoots will uh, send all registered attendees an email when it's available to replay on demand. And so we certainly encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Um, and then following that, it will be hosted as well on the um, DharmaCon segment of the Horizon Discovery website. So with that, until next time, thanks everyone for joining and have a great day.